Well, good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to see you here. Um, how many of you drive? See, so you start with a question that immediately engages everyone. Say, it's a, How many of you are more recent to driving? Let's say maybe you just got your license in the last couple of years. All right, there's a couple of you here. All right, we're, this is going to be primarily for you, but if they struggle... The rest of you guys that are a little bit more experienced can help out a little bit, all right? So, so here's what I got. I got some traffic signs for you guys, and I want to see, let's see how safe we can feel on the road with these new drivers that we have. How well did, do they know their traffic signs? And I'm sure there'll be no problem for you guys, of course, uh, but let's, uh, we'll, we'll give them the first crack at it. And if they falter, then you guys can step in. All right. So, uh, so we got we got our first traffic sign. They 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 get pretty. They start pretty easy. Anybody know what? Any one of you guys know what this sign means? Go ahead, Kristen. I bet you it means there's no outlet. Yeah, but what does that mean? <laughs> it means there's nowhere to plug in your cell phone. <laughs> so what does it mean when there's no outlet? It's a dead end. All right. Oh, good. 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 All right. Feel good. At least, you know, they're not just going to keep driving off the road. So that's, that's excellent. All right. Next one. What, what's that, Taylor? There's a yield ahead. That's right. Now, what does it mean when you yield? You're supposed to let the other ones go first, you know, just merge in there. Come on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you hit the gas and get in there. Uh, yeah, this means that there is a yield uh, coming up ahead, so you, you're supposed to pay attention. All right, good. You guys, you guys are doing all right so far. All right, next one. <laughs> yes, there's snakes on the road <laughs> up ahead. Be careful. All right, anybody know what this one is? Windy road. No, it is actually not windy road. All right, go ahead. Slippery when wet. Slippery when wet. Yes, that, this means that the road might be slippery. Uh, so uh, drive, drive with caution. All right, next one. Anthony. That's the clearance sign. Yeah, because you're a big rig driver, right? So you know exactly. Yeah, this, this tells you how much clearance you have. So if you're going under an overpass... Uh, you know if you're driving a gigantic vehicle whether you can make it or not. Sometimes they have these in drive throughs too, when you're getting tacos. <laughs> All right, good job. You guys are, I'm, I'm impressed. I feel safer already. All right, next one. Yeah, it it's actually means a fire station. It doesn't mean just a random fire truck's coming at you because they don't really know when the fire truck or what direction the fire truck's going. But that means that there is a fire station ahead, which means fire trucks could be flying out of there, so you better pay attention. Now you know. All right. Last one. All right. This one's found only in South Jersey. <laughs> Not quite, but what's this one? There's a farm. That's, that's pretty close. It just means that this is a farm machinery crossing, uh, which means a tractor may pull out on the road and then drive in front of you for the next uh, 10 miles at, at 20 miles an hour. And of course, it's a double line the entire time, so there's no way to go around them. You guys have all experienced this, right? Yeah. Well, good job, guys. You guys have renewed my faith in America's youth. <laughs> Well, when we drive, we literally see hundreds of signs in a few minutes. I, it's funny, I, I have talked to people who live in other countries, and they come to America, and one of the things they say is that they are absolutely amazed in America because there are just signs everywhere. There's signs for everything, so constantly telling us where things are and what to do. And I've been to another country, enough uh, other countries long enough, uh, enough times that this is true. You drive in other countries and it's like, it's every man for himself. I mean, it, there are no signs. People are driving on every side of the road. It's, it can be crazy. But here in America, we have signs everywhere. Uh, some of them we recognize right away and some we see so often that we just pass by without even, even acknowledging them. Like sometimes you only notice a sign when they put a new one up. Um, and 
As a result, sometimes we miss some of those signs. Well, last week we started looking at the conversion of Saul. And he's one of the most unlikely followers of Jesus that we find anywhere in the Bible. And in that, in that opening section, we saw some of the signs that Saul truly had a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. And today we're going to continue to study his conversion to Jesus Christ, where we'll see four more signs that Saul truly had a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, in Acts chapter 9, uh, Luke takes us back to the city of Jerusalem. Remember, in Acts chapter 8, we had that kind of diversion where we followed the ministry of Philip in Samaria, and we saw that the gospel was now beginning to leave the city of Jerusalem, just as Jesus said it would. But here in Acts 9, Luke brings us back to the city of Jerusalem, and when we left, uh, Saul, uh, with the other Pharisees, was beginning a massive persecution of the church. That persecution began in Jerusalem and drove out many of the Hellenistic Jews that had put their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, but that was not good enough for Saul. And as we saw last week, he began to leave the city of Jerusalem. In fact, he's on his way to Damascus, uh, a town several miles away from Jerusalem, for the purpose of hunting down and bringing back as prisoners followers of Jesus Christ. Well, in the first part of the passage that we looked at last week, we we learned about Saul's encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And Luke gives us the first three signs of genuine faith in the life of Saul. We saw that he had faith in Jesus Christ. We saw that Paul go, uh, Saul goes back after his salvation and begins to pray for forgiveness. And we saw that immediately after having a relationship with Jesus Christ, he also received a calling to follow him. Today, we're going to look at the rest of those signs. But first, let's look at this passage in the book of Acts. If you have your Bibles, we're in Acts chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 17 to 30 today. Here's what God's word has to say. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised, who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off, sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Let's pray and we'll look at the rest of Saul's journey to a relationship with Christ. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day and we thank you for the opportunity to continue to look at this incredible transformation. We, we are hard pressed to find someone who is so fervently against you, who so fervently fought for you after coming to know you. So Lord, as we look at the life of Saul today, I pray that we'd not just know the details, but we'd understand what it means for us, 
what it means to have a genuine relationship with you. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, we pick up the nar narrative where we left off last week. Um, Ananias uh, arrives. Saul has been in Damascus now for three days. What, what was he doing during those three days? He was, he was praying, the Bible tells us. That he, he gets to Damascus. He's completely blind. He's praying. God has already told him, I'm going to restore your sight. Someone's going to come and do this. So Saul has been preparing his heart for this. And, but what we see is that Saul receiving his sight is not the greatest gift that he receives in these verses. So we're going to continue to look at the seven signs that we see in this passage of a transformed life. Life, Like we said last week, we looked at the first three. Um, and Luke goes out of his way to make sure that we understand the immensity of the change in Saul's life. So as a result, he gives us even more evidence as if Jesus appearing to them and the prayer and the, uh, and the fact that he kind of jumps right into it, as if that wasn't enough to prove to us that, that Saul genuinely knows Jesus. Luke gives us even more evidence in these passages that we read today. In verse 17, we're told that, that Saul is filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, as we've seen throughout the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is the calling card of genuine salvation. Think back to Acts chapter 2. The, the disciples receive the Holy Spirit. When they, uh, over and over again, we see that the Holy Spirit is God proving that salvation has genuinely happened here. And in these verses, it doesn't specifically tell us that Ananias or Paul see the Holy Spirit come on him. We've, we've seen a couple places in the book of Acts where they actually see the Holy Spirit and dwell, and dwell a person. We don't see this here, in, but Luke makes sure that we know that Saul receives the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he wants us to have no doubt that Saul was a genuine believer. And if we've seen anything in the book of Acts, is that the Holy Spirit is the proof that God has changed someone's life. 2 Corinthians Chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, Paul writes this. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit on our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what was to come. We see the Holy Spirit do many things in the book of Acts, but here in 2 Corinthians, Paul points out one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to seal us for the kingdom of God. He says here, it is God's ownership of us. It is a deposit. It is a down payment. How many of you have ever put a deposit on something? All right, most of you. And what's a deposit for? Yeah, to hold it, right? To your, the person you're buying from, you're putting money up front to tell them, hey, I'm serious. I'm going to come back and I'm going to finish paying for this, right? And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is in our lives. We are, we are not done our work here on earth. So the Holy Spirit is God's deposit on our souls. In other words, it's upfront money. He is saying, I am incredibly serious about my relationship. I'm willing to pay up front to make sure that they have an eternity with me. While Acts chapter 9 uh, shows us these things, we, we see there's two remarkable changes that happen in Paul's life because of the Holy Spirit. God uses the Holy Spirit not simply as a seal, but the Holy Spirit amplifies the good and moves us away from the sin that's in our lives. And that's exactly what happens in the life of Saul. What was the good of Saul even before he knew Jesus Christ? Well, Saul was a gifted leader, wasn't he? Whether he knew Christ or not, could, could Saul lead people? Yeah, people were following him around. They were willing to put people to death. Why? Because Saul had the ability to inspire people. Does that go away because he had the Holy Spirit? Absolutely not. On top of that, he was a gifted thinker, a powerful speaker. He was incredibly strong-willed and a man of powerful convictions. See, the Holy Spirit didn't strip away the amazing natural gifts that Paul had. If anything, it amplified those. God didn't take those abilities away, but through the Holy Spirit, he honed them for his glory. 
See, the truth is, while we are gifted by the Holy Spirit, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And some of the, there are things that I was able to do long before I got saved, but when I got saved, those things became focused. We began to truly understand what those gifts and talents and abilities could be used for in the kingdom of God. Many of you probably could, probably could give testimony of this experience. You had these abilities, and then when you came to know Jesus Christ, you saw how those abilities could be used to further the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit doesn't just amplify the gifts we have. It also moves us away from the sin in our lives. Because while, while Paul had some incredible abilities, he had some incredible shortcomings as well. The Holy Spirit helped sanctify Saul and replace many of his sinful characteristics with godly ones. The hatred that filled Saul's life. Saul had so much hatred that he was willing to pursue people to other cities. He was going out of his way to destroy people's lives. Hatred was replaced with love. Restlessness with peace. Ruthlessness with gentleness. Pride was replaced with humility. See, the Holy Spirit does an incredible work in us. Not only does he seal us, not only is he our deposit of the promise of everlasting life to come, he begins to move us, taking the good that God had created us and making it into great, and taking the sin that is part of us being sinful people and sanctifying us and moving us to the image of his Son. Interestingly, Paul himself recognizes the Holy Spirit's work in his life. And he writes about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Look at what he says. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Paul understood the transformation that he was going through. And Paul embraced it. He didn't say, this is just who I am. He said, Lord, I'm yours. You have purchased me, you have sealed me, and now I want you to change me. We can hold on to our humanness. And I know many followers of Jesus who do. But the reality is God wants to change us from the inside out. And let's be honest, that is not always a pretty process because we got some ugliness going on inside. But the reality is that the Holy Spirit doesn't just guarantee that we're going to heaven. The Holy Spirit desires to work in us, to move us to Jesus Christ. John the Baptist said it this way. He says, I must decrease and he must increase in me. Paul's like, increase away. And that's exactly what he did. Well, another sign that we see that Paul had genuine salvation is found in verses 18 and 19. He had fellowship with believers. Of all the amazing turnarounds that we see in these verses, none is as, as breathtaking as what we see in verses 18 19 look at these verses with me together it says immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eye eyes and he could see again and he got up and was baptized after taking some food he regained his strength Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus Saul had traveled to Damascus to do what to destroy the followers of Jesus in Damascus. And by, verse, and by verse 19, what is he doing? He's fellowshipping with them. He's, he's having genuine relationship in Jesus Christ. That wasn't just on Paul, but that was also on them. The fact that they were willing to embrace and take in Paul. And we see later on, uh, we see later on the people in Jerusalem weren't quite as willing uh, at first to take him in. But we're told that the, that the people of the church in Damascus welcomed him in to the family of God. Here and throughout the rest of this passage, we see the priority that is put on fellowship with other believers in Christ. Psalm 119.63 says this, I am a friend 
to all who fear you and to all who follow your precepts. As followers of Jesus Christ, we're never meant to do this on our own. First and foremost, we have Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit that's working in. But over and over again, we're told that this relationship with Christ is meant to be shared with other people. We're never meant to be an island as followers of Jesus Christ. In fact, the, the very first command that Jesus gives is go and be witnesses. You can't do that by yourself. You can't. Uh, being a witness to someone requires two people. You're not just talking in a mirror about Jesus. It requires relationship. It requires fellowship. In 1 John, we see that fellowship with other believers is not just a nice thing for us to do, but it is a sign that we are actually saved. John, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 says this, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. How do we know we've passed from death to life? How do we know we're saved if we... Love each other. What does that require? It requires fellowship. In other words, what John is saying here is that fellowship isn't just something, oh, we should have, we should have a church picnic once in a while because that's nice. Oh, we should have a share a cup of coffee once in a while because, hey, who doesn't like coffee? Probably many of you. No, it is a genuine sign of a relationship with Jesus Christ, the desire to enter into relationship and fellowship. With others. Well, why does fellowship matter? Why, why, does, why does God put such a high priority on fellowship? Because I can give you literally hundreds of verses in the Bible about the importance of fellowship, but why does it matter? Well, let me show you a picture that illustrates this really well. Uh, we, we got a picture of, of uh, Israel there. Uh, and if you notice, it, it may be a little bit hard to see, but if you notice, Israel has two major bodies of water. Uh, within its land. The, the one at the top is the, anybody know? <laughs> if you can see, if you can't see, you know, it's the Sea of Galilee. Yeah, this is where Jesus spends most of his early, early ministry. He's out there fishing with the disciples all the time. And then down at the southern part of Jerusalem, we have what? The Dead Sea. Yeah. Now, these two bodies of water actually really aren't that, that far apart because Israel is not that big of a country. Uh, but they are very, very different bodies of water. The Sea of Galilee, we see over and over again, especially in the gospel, that people are constantly fishing out of the Sea of Galilee. Why do you think that is? Because it's filled with fish, yeah. <laughs> Except for when the disciples go, they need Jesus to show them where all the fish are. Uh, anyway, but the, the Sea of Galilee is teeming with fish. It's teeming with life. Do you know why the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea? Yeah, because the salt content in the, sea, uh, in, in the Dead Sea is so high that there is literally nothing living in the Dead Sea. Everything, uh, it is a body of water technically, but uh, I've seen pictures of people who have gone into the Dead Sea and they literally float on top of the water because of the density of the salt. The same is true with fellowship. Part of the reason that the Sea of Galilee is teeming with life is because the water is flowing into it. It is moving around. And as a result, it, it is filled with life. Unfortunately for the Dead Sea, there's no water flowing into it. So as a result, it, it, it remains stagnant. The salt content throughout the years has risen and actually continues to rise. Um, and as a result, it becomes dead and stagnant. The same is true with us when it comes to fellowship. When we have people that are coming in and out of our lives, who are able to speak truth into our lives, who are able to encourage us, convict us, and speak truth into our lives, we continue to remain alive in Jesus Christ. Our hearts continue to be stirred. I had the opportunity to go on a mission trip this week, and I got to be around some really wonderful young people. And you know what? It was good for my heart. I felt encouraged and uplifted. It gave me hope. It brought joy into my life. Why? Because I wasn't just by myself. The, the freshness of other followers of Jesus Christ was allowed to move me. As a, as a result, I was encouraged. 
See, without fellowship in our lives, we become stagnant and still. And this is exactly why the Bible commands us not to stop meeting together. Hebrews 10.25 says this, Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. See, gathering together is not just the suggestion of the Bible, it's the command of the Bible. Why? Because God knows that we need to be stirred as people. And listen, different things stir different people. Some of you hear music and your hearts come alive. Some of you open up the word of God and you're like, man, that's a, you stay here forever. Uh, and some of you, you know, we pray together and you feel the, the genuine hand of God. Listen, we're stirred by different things, but very rarely when we are an island are we able to keep that fervent pitch for Jesus Christ. What happened to Saul? What was proof that he got saved? He immediately began connecting with other followers of Jesus Christ and allowing their life to pour into his. The third sign we see today of the relationship that Saul had with Jesus Christ is that in verses 20 to 22, we see that he was immediately had fullness of zeal. Let me ask you a question. According to this passage, what does Paul do as soon as he has strength? What's that? Hey, he fellowships, and then, well, we kind of talked about that. You, maybe that was the answer. You're, you're probably right. What, what does he do? He preaches. Yeah, he gets, yeah, this guy goes, he grabs a bite to eat. Right? This guy, remember, he's been blind for three days, right? So what does he do? He gets up, he grabs a bite to eat, and as soon as he's able, he gets to work. Paul is like many followers of Jesus Christ I've met. As soon as the light comes on in their lives, they understand the truth has been there the whole time, and what do they want to do? They want to get moving. I, I really didn't understand the fullness of my salvation until I was 16 years old. And I have to be honest, I, I kind of I look back on those first 15 years and wonder what I could have done in my school, what I could have done among my friends, what I could have done in my church had I really grasped those things earlier. And I understand that God's timing is perfect and that God is working as he's going to work, but probably every one of us at some point have looked back and said, man, the time I could have spent doing things for the kingdom of God. And to be honest with you, I'm sure Paul had similar feelings. So what did he do? Paul doesn't waste time. What does he do? He immediately begins preaching the word of God to the people that God has put before him. In 1 Corinthians 9.16, Paul confesses this, For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul didn't have a choice. He understood. He's like, listen, I am absolutely compelled to do this. Nothing is going to stop me from doing what God has created me to do. There are few forces on earth that are as powerful as a follower of Jesus who understands what Christ has done for them and are ready to share that truth with others. These people are forces of nature. Paul was certainly one of them, but he certainly wasn't the last. Amen. Mel Trotter was a barber by profession and a drunkard by perversion. He debauched, his debauchery had become so much that when his young daughter died, he stole the shoes that she was to be buried in and pawned them for money to go buy drinks. One night, he staggered into the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago, and he was miraculously and marvelously saved. Burdened for the men of, the, of Skid Row, he opened a rescue mission in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He went on to, for, to found more than 60 missions and become supervisor of a chain of missions stretching from Boston to San Francisco. Did Mel Trotter have regrets about his life before Jesus Christ? Almost certainly. 
But when he came to know Jesus Christ, he became an unstoppable force of the gospel. Why? Because that's what we do. We realize how much we have been saved from, and our desire becomes that all people might know the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ themselves. The final sign we see in these verses of Paul's salvation is his fearlessness in suffering. It may not be obvious from the first reading, but there's actually a sizable gap in in time between verses 22 and 23. And Paul talks about what happened in this, in this time in the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, we read this. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him for 15 days. So what's happening here in verse, if you look at verse 23, it says, after many days had gone by, basically what, what Luke is saying here is, is there's actually a pretty big gap. Uh, Paul was in Damascus. He leaves Damascus to go to Arabia where he spends time studying and growing in his relationship with Christ. And then he actually comes back to Damascus where, he begin, where we pick up verse, the events of verse 23. So there's actually a pretty large gap in the middle of this narrative uh, that Paul fills us in on the details. In his return to Damascus and his time in Jerusalem, he is immediately met by those who want to kill him because of his preaching and belief in Jesus Christ. So after this break, he comes back to Damascus, and after preaching a little bit in Damascus, what happens? Yeah, people want to kill him, right? So the, the, his, the followers and the followers of Jesus in Damascus, what do they do? Yeah, they, they come up with a plan to smuggle Paul out of the city. They put him in a basket. They drop him down, and he goes to Jerusalem. When he gets to Jerusalem, it takes him a little bit, a little bit of time to get connected with the apostles because they were scared of him. And we see that Barnabas uh, kind of bridges that gap for him, and he starts preaching in Jerusalem. And what happens as soon as he starts preaching in Jerusalem? They want to kill him there too. <laughs> so Paul gets a we, we get a little we get a little t uh, taste of what Paul's ministry is like. He basically goes from town to town. He's preaching. It says he's proving Jesus Christ to the Jews that are in Damascus and and, and Jerusalem. And what is their result? They can't beat him, so they wanna they want to kill him. These are the first of many difficulties that Saul slash Paul would face in his ministry. But as we well know, they would not keep him from doing the work that Jesus Christ had called him to do. Why? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, we read this. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Let me ask you a question. Was Saul doing anything that Jesus hadn't first done for him? Did Jesus go to Jerusalem, preach truth to them, try to help people have a right relationship with Jesus Christ? Have an everlasting life? Yeah. How did they treat Jesus? They killed him, right? So what a surprise when Saul, Paul, goes back there. He starts teaching people about Jesus Christ and how they can ever have everlasting life. What do they want to do to him? the exact same thing that they did to Jesus. He's following in the exact footsteps of Jesus Christ. And Saul understood this. He understood what Jesus Christ had gone through for him and that he was willing to go through the same thing. Jesus says this in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. See, listen, let me be honest about something. If anyone tells you that you should come to Jesus Christ and everything is going to be great, they are selling you something, okay? But that's Jesus Christ himself. He says, listen, in this world, you're going to have trouble. There's going to be difficulty. Paul didn't come to Jesus Christ and suddenly everything was just hunky-dory all the time. I mean, look at, 
Paul's life, he runs from town to town. He's beaten, he's whipped, he's stoned. He's chased out of synagogue after synagogue. The promise isn't ease. The promise isn't a lack of difficulty in our lives. The promise is that no matter what difficulty you go through, you don't go through it alone. You have a God who is with you and a God who is working for the good in those difficulties in your life. If someone's trying to sell you a gospel that's going to make everything okay, they're selling you the wrong gospel. The Bible tells us in this world we have trouble. But don't fear, because the God you serve is bigger than your troubles. The God you serve can deliver you through these difficulties. That's the truth that Jesus gave us. Not a life of ease, but a life of trusting in him. Paul also understood that no matter what happens in this world, this world is not the end. Romans 5, verses 3 to 5, he writes this. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. In other words, those difficulties that you have in life, those trials that you put in the hands of Jesus Christ, they are doing something in you. They are moving you towards Christ's likeness. So Paul, he said, listen, if trials and tribulations bring me closer to Christ, then bring on trials and tribulations. He didn't run from them. He didn't hide. He said, these things move me closer to Christ, and I want to be closer to Christ. So bring it on. Saul believed that even in the difficulties of life, God was working on making him more like Jesus. And guess what? Those same promises are true for us the struggles that you're going through in life, and listen, I'm not trying to pretend that those struggles are nothing. Because let's be honest, if we've been alive for more than 15 minutes, we've had difficulty in this life. We've had loss and hurt. The Bible never promises to take those things away. But it promises that God is working in those things to move us towards As true as it was for Paul, it is just as true for us today. So I'll close with this. We spent two weeks looking at the salvation of Paul. We've seen the signs that this man had a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, do you recognize these signs in your life? Like the road signs we saw at the opening, these signs of These are the signs of real and genuine faith in Jesus Christ. And we shouldn't just drive by without looking. But do we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? I've been a pastor long enough to realize just because people are sitting in a church, there's a difference between that and actually knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. My job isn't to stand up here and assume you know Jesus Christ. My job is to share with you how you can know from the Bible that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you have faith in Jesus? Have you confessed your sin and called on him to forgive you? Are you filled with a calling that only comes from Jesus Christ? Do you have the Holy Spirit? Are you fellowshipping with other believers in Jesus Christ? Are you full of passion and zeal to do the Lord's will in your life? And when the difficulties come, are you ready to stand in the face of suffering for the one who stood in the face of suffering for you? These were the signs that Saul knew Jesus Christ as his his Savior. 
I believe they're the same signs that we can look at in our own lives to see if we genuinely know Jesus Christ as our Savior. We read and study the Bible, not just because this is what we do in this portion of the service. We do it so we can look at ourselves and make sure that we are walking in a way that honors and glorifies Him. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to look at the examples that the Bible gives us, to learn from those who come before us. The book of Hebrews says we have this great cloud of witnesses that has gone before us, not just so we can have a bunch of great Bible stories for our Sunday school classes, but so that we can genuinely learn what it means to have a right relationship with you. You haven't left it to guess. You have given us clear and vivid examples of what it means to be truly transformed by your Son, Jesus Christ. So Lord, if there's anyone here today who has not called on your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the Savior of their lives, I pray that they would not hesitate. I pray that they would not wait. I pray they wouldn't find an excuse, but that they would put their faith and trust in your Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. No one deserves this. No one has earned it. It is the gift of God so that no man or woman can boast. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. What we've earned is separation from you. But what you have given us is the gift of God, the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that if we confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we would be saved. There are no mass salvations. It is each and every person's decision to make on their own. But for those who would believe in him, those who would call on his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. That opportunity is for every person, not just sitting in this room right now, but for every person in this world. They have the opportunity to become children of God by calling on your son, Jesus Christ. So I pray if there's anyone here in the sound of my voice that has never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray that they would do so today. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.